Welcome back. Um, now, if uh, martial arts studies is anything, um, it's multidisciplinary. Um, it's not been born from nothing. Um, it hasn't arrived fully formed. Uh, it's in a constant process of uh, elaboration. Is it simply history, Peter? <laughs> Social science, ethnography, anthropology, psychology, film studies, identity studies, hoplology. Any answer um, has to involve both yes and no. Yes, it has to look at these disciplines, but no, it should not be constrained by them or to them. The work of Professor Megan Morris has never been constrained, blinkered or hidebound. It's always been circumspect and multidisciplinary. When I was doing my PhD in cultural studies in the late uh, 90s, <coughs> Megan Morris was spoken about in hushed tones and revered as a kind of demigod. She was renowned for her work on popular culture, film, gender, and the burgeoning fields of film studies and cultural studies, particularly in Australia, but always involved by the diverse international contexts of the institutionalization of cultural studies, gender studies, film studies, and other fields the world over. When she moved to Hong Kong, you could see this change registered in her work. And this is because Professor Morris throws herself into the contexts that she finds and experiences. In Hong Kong, she began researching and writing about Hong Kong film and popular culture. But at the same time, she was setting up the first programs in film and cultural studies at Lingnan University and working ever closer with what became the Inter-Asia Cultural Studies Association. All of this um, produced really fascinating work. Uh, you can get a taste of it just from some of the titles of our essays and things. One of my favorite essays, certainly uh, one of my all-time favorite essay titles by Megan Morris is called On English as a Chinese Language. Let's just have a little think about that for a second. Um, in terms of martial arts studies, one of the very first essays that really hit home for me and really helped me when I was first trying to start thinking and writing about martial arts in culture and society was uh, Megan Morris's 2001 essay, Learning from Bruce Lee. If any of you have read any of my work, you'll know that I reference this essay repeatedly. That's because it's exceptional in virtually every register that I know. Certainly back when I was trying to work out how I should begin, this essay was a beacon, a kind of guiding light. But Professor Morris isn't really a martial arts studies person, whatever the word really might here signify. She's what you might call a cultural studies person, cultural studies royalty, in fact. Uh, last year, she was honored by the International Association for Cultural Studies, the ACS, at its massive biannual conference, which that year was in Sydney, with an entire session dedicated to paying tribute to her and her work. That doesn't happen, you know, that kind of thing just doesn't happen, but it does. Perhaps most relevant for us in this context um, is that she absolutely loves martial arts films and martial arts related culture, texts and popular cultural formations. She's an exceptional reader of all of this, an exceptional thinker, relating martial arts texts and contexts to wider contexts and issues and viewing them all through uh, all kinds of prisms and lenses and questions, big and small, macro and micro, simple and complex. It's because of this love and this vast experience that I'm delighted to have Megan Morris back with us today. She has helped me and us uh, in all of my and our martial arts studies endeavors since day one. Despite her ludicrously busy schedule, she does reviewing for us, she offers advice, she contributes, she writes for us. She came to our first conference here in 2015 and gave a fascinating presentation. I'm delighted that she enjoyed it enough to want to come back again this year and I'm even more excited um, about her topic this year. So I'll now turn the floor over to her. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Megan Morris. Okay. Thank you, Paul. I was just telling some people at lunch that I always start losing my voice about four minutes into speaking. This always happens. It's happened since I was a child debater. Um, but the kindness of your welcome takes my voice away before I even get four minutes in. So thank you very much and thank you to everybody who helped uh, to bring us here. You'll notice that um, I'm crediting a co-author or a collaborator 
on this talk. Um, my former colleague in Hong Kong, Stephen uh, Ching Kyu Chan, um, and I, along with uh, <clears throat> another colleague, Lei Siu Leung, who is now Dean of Chinese Operas at the Hong Kong Academy of Performing Arts, so he's pretty much paralysed for anything except institutional politics. But the three of us have been working for 15 years uh, on a book project around the transformations of Kung Fu cinema in Hong Kong since 1949. And in my discussions with Stephen, I've now got to the point where I don't know whose ideas are what. Uh, so in discussion with him, I thought I should present this as, as a joint uh, talk. The second reason, and this is germane to some issues that I'll touch on, is that I am illiterate in Chinese. Uh, I have a limited capacity in Cantonese. I can terrify taxi drivers because someone who looks not like me should not know the foul language that I do, which uh, I learned in a gym. And I have an excellent vocabulary for food. But spoken, uh, written Chinese, uh, I'm an illiterate, and some of the figures that I'm going to be showing you and discussing uh, are illiterate uh, martial artists. And like me, the fictional figures I will show you a good martial artist. I'm a very bad one. I'm a really bad boxer. In fact, these days, now that I've injured my rotator cuffs as well as my hips, I'm pretty much a notional boxer at the moment, but I live in hope. <clears throat> Disenchanting Jiang Hu, uh, historical experience in the Kung Fu refusenik in cinema, is actually the title, here it goes, of a paper that I will write. Uh, I can only sketch a little bit of it today because in responding to Paul's invitation, I started thinking about two framing things, that this is a moment of field creation or a part of that process. So two questions that came to my mind were firstly, what can my kind of film cultural studies bring to martial arts studies? And secondly, what is the kind of topic that is emerging in common? And one of the ones that we will be discussing tomorrow, I think, in the workshops and round table is embodiment. So those issues and what film cultural studies brings into martial arts studies is uh, more what I am going to be addressing today. Now, let me do this right. But first, I want to lay down some, some of my ground rules about film studies and how do you look at a film in the way that I find it interesting to approach uh, movies, martial arts movies. One approach, which I think is very interesting, but I don't myself actually practice, is to look at the actors in Hong Kong cinema who were accomplished martial artists. Increasingly in the 80s and 90s, and certainly today, that's usually not the hero. It's you know, a minor figure or a structural, structurally important person. In the key film that I want to think through today, uh, Zhang Zhe's famous 1975 film called, uh, in English, Disciples of Shaolin. Uh, but the original title actually translates and should translate as the Hunga Kid. This is the brother of the hero and this actor uh, was the accomplished martial artist. He actually uh, set up his own school at one point. Uh, and within the film, 
Wang Hon is the character's name. Um, the actor's name is Chi Quan Shen. He, within the film, withholds his hunger until he's forced uh, to use it. And he advises his smarty pants, arrogant, swaggering young brother also to keep his kung fu under wraps. You can follow some of these people. Some of them are really, really interesting because in the 70s and 80s, some of the most accomplished martial artists in Hong Kong cinema weren't from Hong Kong. They were Korean or they were Peranakan Chinese who'd come up from Southeast Asia, excuse me, often uh, through Singapore. That's not what I do, but it is something you can do. I don't look at fight clips, and I'll show you something about that in a moment. But I do have a premise, and after Peter's talk yesterday and some discussion in a panel this morning, I want to lay out very simply my first premise. Films are real. They're not the opposite of reality. They, don't, uh, they do produce fiction. But one of the difficulties for film studies is that, yes, they're real in the way that dreams are real, but the kinds of logics that we need in order to grasp the quality and the nature of their reality, particularly as complexly produced socioeconomic productions and as productions that affect people's lives, but in ways that even the best marketers cannot guarantee, there is a volatility to the period of impact of a cinema, of a film, that makes it difficult to settle on a way of approaching the reality, the realness of cinema uh, in a way that convinces anybody who isn't madly into film studies. <coughs> Thank you too excited and I'm banging on that. Films are real. Okay. <laughs> Point one. Um, now, so I have some issues sometimes with how historians talk about cinema. Peter is a fabulous target, right? Because he says in black and white, poof, things that a lot of historians think, but they, they don't say. You know, um, <clears throat> and I'm not interested here today in uh, a combative relationship to that, but as a different kind of combative move, I want to rephrase something that Peter wrote in an article on <clears throat> practicing martial arts versus studying martial arts. Peter wrote, practice has a history and thus, history informs practice. Martial arts has a history, and there are real historical records that can be researched to bring martial arts into historical study. My rephrasing is, filmmaking practice has a history. And thus, history, but there, what I'm meaning by history is becoming vaguer, history informs filmmaking practice. Martial arts cinema has a history. And there are real historical records, including the film texts, that can be researched to bring martial arts cinema into historical study. So I want to put us on the same plane on that point, whether Peter likes it or not. I see these propositions as continuous. That doesn't mean that I think historiography and film studies are the same thing. I think a lot of these differences are actually differences at the level of meta-discourse, differences in our practices of verification, our legitimation stories, what we do with archives. Um, 
But there is a creature that inhabits basically the Rupert Murdoch press worldwide called the postmodernist who doesn't think anything's real and doesn't believe in truth. That's not me. And it's not anybody with half a brain in film and cultural studies. That's my most combative observation. <laughs> So Stephen and I have been interested in a kind of shift in the last few years in what is actually a long-standing uh, thematic within um, Hong Kong martial arts fiction, generally speaking, both literary and cinema, of looking at the process of disenchantment with the martial world. Let me leave Jung Hu here at the moment at a very simple level of de definition. Uh, the martial world is, is a good way to indicate it. Uh, literally, people will tell you endlessly, it means rivers and lakes. If you're from Australia as I am, that's a completely meaningless proposition. We never get to see that much water. Um, Marshes, the outlaw marshes, the famous ancient novel can be either called the water margin or outlaws of the marshes. Badlands is sometimes not a bad description. But in contemporary Hong Kong life in Cantonese, Jung Hu is also something you can say casually about political life. You know, um, or if you're retiring from the cut and thrust of your job, you can say, oh, thank God, I am leaving Zhang Hu, the world of striving and struggle. Uh, and these stories of disenchantment, I'll mention a couple in a moment, but suddenly appeared really important to me when I was rereading a little while ago, Doug Farah and John Whalenbridge's uh, introduction to martial arts transnationalism and embodied knowledge, um, where they say all martial arts discourse contains, quote, rich elaborations on the same basic story that by training the body properly, by training the body properly, one may enter an alternative space. Jung Hu is an alternative space, which is real but out there and in a very shifty relationship to the mundane, you know, everyday world. And for Farah and Whalen Bridge, this alternative space is one not characterised by disenchantment. Individual re-enchantment can also be an embodied lived allegory of social re-enchantment and in turn of larger communal selves. I think this is a very familiar story, a very convincing story about how people feel they got involved in martial arts, like suddenly something magic. But it's also a Western social scientist's story where one of the originary social science stories about modernity is about disenchantment. The modern world is a disenchanted one. Zhang Hu literature, um, I think, has a much more complicated approach to this question. People often say, or Western people often say, and I completely sympathise, that Kung Fu cinema is a lot more accessible than wuxia or swordplay um, cinema. And it's taken me 20 years. Finally, this year, I understood the famous Wong Kar Wai film, Ashes of Time, which used to send me screaming into the lounge room and turning it off after five minutes. But one of the reasons, and many of you will know this better than I do, one of the reasons why wuxia films are difficult for non or for people who are illiterate in Chinese, is that we haven't read Jin Yong's novels. And we certainly haven't read any of the other literary fictions on which the film stories are based. So to try to watch uh, a very fine swordplay film without access to that written 
heritage of fiction is a bit like trying to make a joke along the lines of winter is coming to someone who's never seen or read Game of Thrones and never even heard about it. You know, there's just no frame of reference. And that's what goes wrong with a lot of the sword play stories. Now, within Jin Yong's fictions and uh, some of the you know, older stories and legends and operas uh, that his work draws upon, people are often trying to get out of Jiang Hu or they're trying to leave it. They're washing their hands in the golden bowl. They're uh, heading out for the hills and woods of reclusion where they can practice music with none of the you know, blood and graft and corruption of the martial world. But in recent times, I think Hong Kong cinema has started to produce some truly exceptional films, which are about the move to disenchant the entire mythology, which doesn't necessarily mean giving up martial arts, but it means revising the significance of all of this inherited culture. One of the most wonderful uh, for me is this film in the middle called Wuxia, sadly translated and circulated in English as Dragon. You know, because they're, they're scared of the foreignness of the mythology, when the films are packaged into English, the links are cut that make sense of the analytical level of the film. Wuxia is a film about the one-armed swordsman but what is disenchanting about the legend of the one-armed swordsman is that in Wuxia, the hero cuts off his own arm at the end of the film in order to avoid the law of the father, in order to avoid the patriarchal responsibility to grow up and become a mass murderer. And the clarity of that is embodied in the fact that in Wuxia, the mass murdering father is played by Wong Yu, Jimmy Wong Yu, who as a young man was the famous original Zhang Zhe one-armed swordsman. So it's a film about that inheritance today and what do you do with it. Sadly, it was a huge flop at the box office and the director said he was going back to making bourgeois rom-coms set in Shanghai. But we can always hope that he will return to this material. This one, I think, is fabulous. One of the, the great films of recent years. It's a decent translation of the original title, which is One Man's or One Person's Wu Lin. Wu Lin is another word for a variant of Zhang Hu, but it's better translated in English as the Greenwoods. You know, there's a famous uh, article by Chen Ping Yuan that, that looks at the spatial distribution and the connotations of the outlaw marshes, which are activist and politically charged. There's Wu Lin or the Greenwood, which is kind of criminal. And that's sort of heading more towards the other Zhang Hu of the gangster film and of the streets of real life. Uh, and then there's the hill and the recluse. Now here, the gangster Zhang Hu in Kung Fu Jungle and the uh, martial arts Zhang Hu uh, are fused. And I'm hoping that at the end of my talk, I can say why I think this is such an important film, but what particular element of it I would begin to think with. And it isn't Donnie Yen's martial arts. The refused Nicks are often the bearers of these stories of leaving or trying to leave Zhang Hu. Refused Nick is an interesting word because it, its meaning has flipped um, in colloquial English. Refused Nicks originally were Jews who were refused permission by the Soviet Union to leave for Israel. So the original refusenik is someone who is refused. So they were like the young men sitting outside Shaolin Temple and the abbot won't let them in. They're, they're that first stage refusenik. 
But today we often use this to mean somebody who affirmatively refuses. And again, in recent years, we've seen some extraordinary refuseniks surface in the Hong Kong cinema. The one on the right, whom you can hardly see, is Louis Ku in Johnny To's film um, Throwdown about judo. He's a judo master who just becomes a hopeless, useless alcoholic. People are chasing him endlessly to replay his last fight, but he just says, oh, give me another drink. We don't know why. We don't know why he is refusing this. We do find out at the end. There is a reason. I won't tell you in case you haven't seen the film. But importantly, at the end of Throwdown, there is not exactly a redemption, but a return to the creative source. Uh, the last fight in Throwdown is iconographically a reiteration, and that's a word I'm going to use quite a bit, a reiteration of the famous closing scene of Kurosawa Akiro's 1943 seedbed film, Sanshiro Sugata, or Sugata Sanshiro, the last fight in the grass field under the open sky. But here it's at night and in this kind of cramped Hong Kong space. The major, major refusenik, I think probably the most transgressive ever, is uh, Gong Er, the woman in The Grand Master. Um, she, I assume some of you will have seen this. I can't believe I'm talking about Wong Kar Wai. I hate Wong Kar Wai. But one of the troubles with film studies is if you watch something 15 times, you fall in love with it. So there we go. Um, she, when her father is defeated by Yip Man, she commits two almost unimaginable crimes. She extinguishes the family line, right, which she refuses to marry or have children, which means she refuses to leave Jung Hu, but she has the opportunity. She won't do that. Uh, and John Christopher Hamm, I think, in Paper Swordsman, which is, is an excellent entry point um, to Jin Yong, if you have not, um, if you're illiterate like me. Um, he describes this as, you know, the kind of ultimate crime um, or the most cardinal of sins to deliberately and knowingly obliterate your family line. But she does something even worse. She extinguishes her lineage. She refuses not only to have children, but she refuses to teach. And she's the last holder of the knowledge. Wow, you know, and it's very interesting gender kind of thing going on there, which I don't have time to talk about now. So these, these three films, Wuxia, <coughs> Dragon, Throwdown, about judo, uh, and The Grand Master, are all in a sense, in the, exactly the way as I think Peter described on a larger scale yesterday, but going back into traditional materials, reiterating them, prolonging them, but also profoundly undermining them and changing their significance. Now, for Stephen and me, the question is why? You know, we do cultural studies. Unlike straightforward film studies, cultural studies has always got a so what question. Film studies, people can do what historians do. Historians, you can say, why did you write a biography of so-and-so? And they will say, <clears throat> the archive was there. The letters were there. Uh, a film studies person would go, well, why not? It's a film. That's what I do. Cultural studies is very annoying practice. You, one of the reasons a lot of cultural studies is quite bad is that if you ask, so what, <coughs> students can be trained to reach for some huge proposition about race, gender, disability, uh, any kind of issue, and sort of overload the political significance of some silly little essay they've written about one scene in a, in a movie. You know, it's always going to be fighting the good fight of the transformation of civilization. No. 
But if you don't answer it that way, you do have to find a responsible answer to the so what. So we look at these uh, films and try to situate them in Hong Kong's very fraught, complex and volatile present. Um, now, I mentioned uh, reiteration, and I said at the beginning that when I come to look at a film, I don't start with the fight scenes. There's nothing wrong with that. The point I want to make, alongside films are real, is that the documentary and the instrumental use of cinema to record, to create an archive, to pass on knowledge is as old as the cinema itself. It's almost coextensive with the history of cinema. One of the reasons, I mean, this is a great um, YouTube site on Victorian and Edwardian uh, martial arts and exercise films, but one of the reasons there's a lot about Savat is that France was crucially important in the early development of cinema but also they started developing curatorial practices and interests, quite nationalistic interests, in documenting the history of French importance in cinema. So you have this huge collection of Savat clips. And I would recommend, if you watch the one on the left, which is fabulous, of these uh, chasseurs alpins dancing in the snow, turn down the sound. You know, they've put this campy... It's, unbelievably camp and funny with the sound over it, but I think it's more respectful to see it in the silence that is its due. More interesting to me is 1924, this moment, another, let's say, instrumental, but I'd prefer to say autodidactic use of cinema. Uh, Paul, like many people, has told us lovely stories about watching DVDs and trying to learn from Bruce Lee films, other martial arts films. 1920s is really the decade of the <clears throat> takeoff of advertising as a, as a culture worldwide. Wrigley's chewing gum gets going in the 1920s. But here, there's a little bit of debate about whether this is Joseph Charlemont or Charles, I think it's Charles the Son, um, who has a, a great film that is a promotion of Savat. Uh, the person on the left here is a, a woman with like, long hair, and the message is French boxing is accessible to everybody. And you can, you can watch this film at some length. But embodiment is really hard to talk about in cinema. And I'm going to do up my shoelaces or I'll fall over which is a really bad accident of embodiment. Thank you. Um, because mostly what people do is talk about the representation of embodiment. They tell, people take a film, they write their own little text, which is a plot summary, and then, you know, find some indicators of gender, race, sexuality, colonialism, uh, and write a moral diagnosis of the little plot summary they themselves have produced. We teach students to do this, a very teachable technique. People do learn things, but that is not thinking about embodiment. In fact, to me, to think about embodiment in cinema rather than the moment of filming the film, you look at the audience. That's where... In true cinema, uh, I mean primal cinema, true is a stupid word today, it's in that context. Um, this is something that everybody who's ever been in a classic theatrical cinema situation has felt, but we almost never see it unstaged. This is me and my husband watching Baz Luhrmann's Australia on a massive screen, and there's a cattle stampede and the cows are coming straight at you, and one of the great ham actors of Australian cinema is dying under the cattle hoof. A very florid, melodramatic death. Uh, a friend of mine, who is a, a leading art photographer, had somehow smuggled into the cinema a giant camera 
And, she, and that is actually an in-the-moment shot of an audience response to a huge action moment. I particularly love it because it is so stereotypically gendered, right? There's cliche going on here. I, that's me, am going, <gasps> mm. you know, my traps are heading for my ears. I'm completely overwhelmed and engrossed in melodrama. My husband is going, oh, what a crock of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and when you see the original, uh, the whole image on, on my left is uh, one of the first big film producers of Australian cinema. In fact, Quentin Tarantino has pinched half of his exploitation stories and he has exactly the same look as my husband. It's like, oh, fuck Jack. That's so bad. Uh, but the key point for me is that all of these reactions are embodied. If you're laughing at a cliche, if you're groaning at it, if you're going, oh, you're involved and it is a, a deeply physical experience. I personally think that in the whole kind of sequence of possibilities now that goes right through all the different ways that you can use cinema in digital form, that is still the case. Probably lying back watching a DVD, getting drunk is a fairly low key mode of embodiment, but that's what it is. And the one that puts the autodidactic use on your phone, you can see people in the gym every other day risking serious injury because they're trying to perform some heavy lift while looking <laughs> at the DVD and how to do it. It's quite dangerous. The old days of DVD were safer, you know, with a little, little kind of pause. So, so we need to think about what happens to people's bodies and feelings and affect when we watch. But in martial arts cinema in particular, I don't know if you can see that, that's actually maybe a little too dark. American, American martial arts cinema is actually full of representations of audience embodiment. And part of the way that you are involved in the film is you get this completely repellent image of yourself watching violence. It comes back to some of the things Sixth was talking about. This is one of the great, most horrifying deathmatch audiences in Best of the Best 2 by Robert Radler. And you either reject or, you know, maybe sometimes accept this image of your own audience activity watching the action go down. But there's another version which puzzles people who don't watch a lot of cinema, and that's the kitten, um, the totemic representative of the audience. This is the kitten that's watching Bruce Lee fight Chuck Norris in the Coliseum in Way of the Dragon. And at a certain moment, the kitten mimics Bruce Lee. There's the whole kind of animistic interchange between them. But of course, this is a much more sort of sweetie pie image of you, the audience, going, yeah, Bruce, get him down. Um, you, you become Bruce through the uh, totemic audience person. And it's reiterated in the soundtrack of Bloodsport, another originary film in 1988, where you can see people online going, oh my God, why is there a kitten meowing all the way through the soundtrack of Bloodsport? Now, maybe it was an accident, um, but there actually is a shot of a kitten watching uh, a tournament um, in there. So if we're going to say films are real, but their reality is greatly reduced and minimised if we just treat them as representation or as stories. They are both those things, um, but there's a lot more to cinema and why it's had an impact. For me, um, there are two available theories about this. They're both pretty difficult. 
But the ex uh, one is an essay by Paul Willeman from the 1980s, which uses the work of the Russian thinker Vygotsky to talk about what goes on in your mind when you watch a film. The other one comes out of um, uh, the books on cinema by Gilles Deleuze, which I, I adore Deleuze. I was taught by Deleuze, but I find those books unreadable. Um, they come to me in a form I can use through Kara Keeling, who's an African-American queer studies person. And she has a book called The Witch's Flight, The Cinematic, The Black Femme and The Image of Common Sense. And her approach to what happens in the cinema and how we recognise, how do we make sense of these pixels um, is through the concept of common sense. She looks at films that try to represent common sense but also how common sense works in the way that we come to understand an image and respond to it. And her entry point is cliché, which is really ideal for martial arts cinema. Cliché is a term that I use lovingly, not abusively, not camply. Without cliché, community in a cultural activity cannot really take place. Cliché should be respected, unless it's done badly, which of course a lot of cliché is, or used maliciously. A cliché for killing can be understood as a common memory image directed onto a perception prepared according to a common sensory motor schemata. Now, this is this difficult vocabulary out of Deleuze, but the sensory motor movement is that. That's what it is. Like my eyes see something, my traps hit, hit my ears and knock the microphone away. Yeah. Um, the senses you move in response physically, in response to cognition. And this happens um, because we have collective memory images that include experiences, knowledges, traditions and so on that are available to memory during perception. Uh, one of Paul's favourite writers, Ray Chow, has a, a, a version of this called pre-gazing that you understand a film because of what you saw before you ever went near the film. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to make any sense of it. I find pre-gazing, you know, a little bit kind of heavy. Um, and I like this idea of common sense and cliché. Let's take the gun cliché. Uh, two years ago, I was telling Peter this earlier, I discussed a moment in his book where he says to us that, of course, the Ming had guns all the way along the Great Wall, and this is baseless nonsense to represent guns as something new or shocking um, in the Chinese world. And my response then was, well, yeah, of course, but the question is, especially when you're dealing with Chinese people who know perfectly well that the Ming had guns, why does the question recur? Why does this theme come back? And when does it come back? What I want to suggest this year is that, in fact, it's very rarely about the West or the shock of modernity. That the gun cliche, yes, sometimes is about those things, but usually when people are thinking about that, they're thinking about the Choi Hak moment and Once Upon a Time in China. The, the films made in that very fraught period, 1984 to 1997, when Hong Kong knew that the handover was going to happen and all kinds of reflection are going on through the cinema. But in fact, it's, it's a very much older preoccupation and it's what we could call the question concerning technology. It doesn't have to be Western technology, it just fictionally sometimes is. This is a, a clip from the fabulous 1964 Buddhist Palm Part 2, um, in which a Buddhist Palm expert is caught in a maze, and Lee Siu Lung has written an article about this, comes up to a gate and goes, Nothing happens, and he goes, ha, this must be a steel door. 
That's why the first Buddhist strike didn't work. And this is a film set in Once Upon a Time, long ago China, right? But the, the Buddhist palm master knows a steel door when he sees it. He tries again and this time he manages to open it. But then this happens. Some 1950s robots come out. And for some reason that remains obscure, he doesn't try to even use his Buddhist palm. He tries to use this weapon, but the robots crunch it and he runs away. And that's the end of that uh, sequence. It's about different kinds of technology. And I think, first of all, we need to remember that when it is used to talk about uh, threats, to the future of Chinese martial arts. First of all, that's a Chinese discourse, not necessarily in the sense, nonsensical one from outside. But more importantly, it belongs to a genre of anxiety, which Gloria Davies has written this very important history of the discourse genre called worrying about China, um, the language of Chinese critical inquiry. And I think the argument would be that the constant threat of death, which we hear about in Hong Kong recently, Hong Kong is dying, everything Kung Fu is dying. The point of that is to project a future in some terms that don't necessarily require calling for some new massive um, transformation. Gloria Davies doesn't think that worrying about China is a particularly useful uh, genre, but it is one. And films participate in these much wider circles of debate. Now, let me show you, finally, a couple of clips. How am I doing for time? Uh, yeah? OK. I'll show you a reiteration. This is not like a whole film remake. It's not one cliche, it's the replaying of a scene for reasons that you, especially if you're a, a critic, you have to think about, like, why is that happening? I'll start with a clip from a recent uh, wonderful film about the warlord period in China, Call of Her Heroes, it has a very strong political edge um, in terms of how people live, what kind of ethics should you have in a period where your leadership is rotten. I won't pursue that like, any further, but that's, that's what's going on there. Yeah, I'm sure we all can. Now, ex where's my escape gone? I put my talk on it, that's uh -huh. where it's gone. Okay, we're good. This is a, oh, Jesus, come on. That's the one. This is a gun thing, but again, no Westerners. Okay. Now, people, a lot of people said, my God, you know, this is a wonderful film. What is Louis Kuh Louis Kuh doing 
carrying on like a 1970s <laughs> Hong Kong villain. Now, Louis Ku is a fantastic actor. He is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful actor. Well, this is what he's doing. Let me take you back to 1989 and um, Stephen Chow's From Beijing With Love, uh, which is a spoof on the James Bond films, but also a comedy about the primitive technology in uh, early, you know, in Cantonese martial arts uh, film. Is this going to do the right thing? Yes. Okay, I don't have uh, time to take you right through um, that scene, but at the end of it, Stephen Chow castrates the gun with the butcher's knife and the, the front of the gun falls, falls on. But the uh, frame of reference is to The Man with the Golden Gun um, from 1974, the American film. Now, those two films are doing very different things at different times. I think this, this recent film... Um, shows for me a moment of immense dignity where the martial artist who doesn't have a gun um, controls his slightly hysterical fear, laughter, breathes and just has a go, you know, like maybe I can stop this bullet. But the key thematic isn't even about guns. It's about metal and metal. It's folly follow the quality of the metal and the quality of the Kung Fu on either side, the technique. Um, and if you follow the metal, you come to the second and last cliche that I, I want to talk about today, which is the shoe. Um, another film that loses its meaning in English, although Kickboxer is not a, a bad effort, um, Wait a minute. It uh, stars Yun Biao. It, it kind of attaches itself to the Wong Fei Hung story, um, but Wong Fei Hung is not there at all in the story. He's out of town. So Yun Biao can like go for it and fight everybody. Um, but at the beginning, there are these gold shoes, these technologically enhanced shoes worn by the rare honest policeman. And there's a lot of repetitive uh, cinematography about the impact of metal on flesh. But it is this notion of technology literalized that technology is an extension of the martial body, uh, not a contradiction of it. Um, and The shoe, in fact, um, plays an absolutely crucial role in terms of stories in Hong Kong cinema about Kung Fu, technique, ethics and social class. And this is where, for me, um, I said I wanted to put my interests on the same plane as the historians here. Uh, Judkins and O'Neill's book was an absolute um, revelation. I put posted notes on every page and then found at the end I had to go right back through the book uh, in order to find out. But you see, film critics were often accused of peddling myth uh, instead of historical reality. But we are trained debunkers. Debunking is what we do. If you grew up as I did, and then in a later generation, Paul did, cutting your teeth on Roland Barthes, on Derrida, on all of these 
critical things, it's a real shock to actually discover that a lot of the materials of cinema, even cinema you know might pretty well, actually have a foundation in social history because our basic premise is that they probably don't. Right? We're never shocked by historical debunkings. We're likely to go, uh-huh, like who ever thought that anyway? You read um, Ben's sort of, and, and uh, O'Neill's wonderful chapters um, on the formation of the martial arts economy in Guangdong, particularly in the second half of the 19th century, then two very important films suddenly look much more like social history documentaries than I ever imagined they could be. The first of them, called Disciples of Shaolin, which I mentioned at the beginning, actually called The Hongar Kid, and then that was remade by Johnny Toe in 1993 as The Barefooted Kid. It was reiterated. And I'm going to um, very quickly show you uh, the difference. But the shoe, the shoe is the signifier of the, what spends phrase here, the poor peasants streaming in from the countryside. These are guys who literally come out of nowhere and they've, their characters has never had a pair of shoes. Um, and first of all, this, uh, that's 1975 up the top, 1993 down below. First of all, they're given a hand-me-down pair of shoes and a beautiful young woman finally teaches them how to keep it on by putting some paper in the toe because the shoe keeps coming off. And the process of their corruption goes by way of the provision of even more beautiful and well-fitting shoes by bad factory or textile mill owners who want to knock off the competition um, for whom these martial artists initially worked. Disciples of Shaolin in film history, just quickly before... Oh, fuck you. Excuse me. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's go from this here. Yeah, no, I just want to go forward, but I, I hit the wrong thing. Oh, I, I want to get rid of this sucker. <laughs> yeah, good, thank you. Um, it's really important in film history. It was the last collaboration, as far as we know, of the two great auteurs of the... Uh, the period, Lao Ka Leung up the top and Zhang Zhe down below, each of them posed in what you could call their favourite cliché of what they represented as directors. Um, the, the man with the lineage and traditions up the top, the uh, big cigar film director down the bottom. Zhang Zhe is actually a literary critic. He's much more like Francois Truffaut than like a, uh, a Hollywood mogul, but they fell out in the making of this film over various artistic differences. They did have very different visions. Chang Zhe couldn't care less whether um, martial arts could defeat bullets or not. He didn't really care about the difference between one martial arts style and another. Uh, he just liked to make great movies, although he was interested and practised and learned a few things. Whereas La Calung felt it was, it was very important not to produce films claiming that martial arts could confront guns, that you had to be realistic and respectful about actual practices. So they compressed and they ruptured. And the other thing about this film is that it's, it's in fact not particularly gory or bloody for a Chang Zhe film. He's famous for masochist, sadomasochistic male anguish. Uh, just right at the end, Alexander Fusheng disembowels himself spectacularly. And this is the reiteration of an old element out of late Qing opera, um, which was very, very popular. Uh, a general from, again, an older story is supposed to have had a terrible wound and he wraps up his bowels and goes on fighting, as indeed does this. And I just love Hong Kong English, the big fight with wrapped up bowels, like, <laughs> wow, you know. 
Um, but then Stephen told me that can also be a word for the sexual act, as he put it. And I said, what is wrong with you people? I do not want to, I do not want to know about that. But at the beginning, this motif that um, La Carlung invented, you know, a lot of the old Kung Fu films, you have this staged prelude. This one is particularly powerful about the body labouring. Like, Fu Sheng does practically nothing but breathe. Yeah, so that means stop now? No, 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 just, just, you know, I'm just Just give me, give me a, a time. Can you do a few more yeah, 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 I can. I just yeah. lost half a one. <laughs> um, he, that's all he does. He does this exercise. And there's a, a wonderful um, book out recently by Yip Man Fung that argues that the changes in Hong Kong cinema can actually be understood in terms of the changes of the quality of labour uh, from this time to the next, uh, to today. But, but the film's not particularly bloody because what he is actually about <coughs> most of the time is what Judkins and O'Neill call Guangdong's highly polarised and reactionary class structure. You can't get anything much more explicit than this. Here is the refusenik, the older brother, who says to the young one, these are very bad people, these mill owners. They're hiring our labour, but you have no idea how evil they are. Do not show them your kung fu. And he feels like this because he has overheard them at dinner. And you see what the mill owner is saying, having these men is merely like keeping dogs. I don't care if they're dead or alive. He has just run in from the slaughter of a battlefield. It's just a battle between two rival textile mills. Uh, with their little militias, their <coughs> amateur martial arts brigades. But in the moment of death, this not very good paid martial artist, as his leg comes up, he loses his shoe um, because he, he's fought this whole battle in ill-fitting shoes. Illiteracy is another theme, but it's much stronger in the uh, remake in 1993, which has really different concerns. And I think I'll show you these two clips and then stop um, and we can have a bit of discussion. This is 1975. <laughs> Okay, 1993, really different vision of the mills of the past. Oh, piss off. Excuse me.
瞎子。At another occasion, I then move to 1995 and Choi Huck's The Blade, you know, where the ruined streaks of cloth in shreds are hanging outside this completely chaotic and screwed up landscape two years before uh, the return to China. I don't have time now. I'll just add, um, I'll end with one point, which is about the, um, the ways in which the past comes back to be reused in Kung Fu cinema. Well, I think to this day, the best article on the Wong Fei Hung mythology is by Hector Rodriguez in 1997, oddly, where he said there's a very peculiar feature to these stories. Uh, the Wong Fei Hung movies, you know, there's about 80 of them, but they have this habit of just stopping the narrative and giving you a long documentary performance, either of a, 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 a real martial artist, of a folk song. And he calls this the ongoing archive of Cantonese popular culture, which they were composing at that time, but very much, that's nine, early 1940s, uh, late 1940s, very much in the spirit of um, initiatives on the mainland at that time to preserve and understand popular culture. In 1975, the scene, one of the scenes I would begin with is the bone setting scene. Wong Fei Hong, of course, was a, a bone setter. I had this done to me in Tun Mun in 2003. Uh, I tore all the ligaments in my foot, like all of them. And um, the Western doctor couldn't do a thing and I was taken to the bone setter and they boil your foot, they boil your foot, I swear, in mud and leaves and then put these poultices on and this very primitive kind of bandage and oh my God, it worked. Um, it's also going on in the barefooted kid where you have secret dyeing, the recipe for secret dye. Cantonese traditional culture loves secrets and handed down secrets and things that not everybody can know. So where would I start talking about Kung Fu Jungle? Well, I wouldn't start with the fight scene. I'd start with the bone setting scene um, where Donnie Yen at the very beginning of this film um, is doing his traditional job as a bone setter inside the prison where he has been sent for having accidentally excessively overkilled um, when uh, chasing a perpetrator. Stephen thinks that Kung Fu Jungle is an interesting departure because it presents a credible, what he calls a credible Jung Hu. How could you have such a thing? Well, the martial artists who are being killed by a psychotic martial artist have all left Jung Hu one way or another. It's all over and they have crappy ordinary jobs. They're an artist. That's not a crappy job, but one of them is an artist, one of them is a teacher, one of them is reduced to being a stunt man. Uh, and the mad martial artist who is pursuing them is dedicated to a belief that Sixth would probably like, which is real martial arts is for killing. And he goes through and he kills each one of these experts, but in the process, he exterminates that art within the world of this film. So where is the disenchantment? Well, Donnie Yen's character had started a sect in Fushan and wanted to unify the martial arts and wanted to establish superiority over all the martial arts. Through this process of extermination, by the end of the film, he has actually given up that fantasy. He goes back, we think, working a bit for the government, a crappy ordinary job, but he goes back to teach and work without these superior ambitions, without these mythological but ultimately murderous drives to unify and conquer all under the little heaven of Fushan. Thank you. Thank you very much.
My pleasure. Um, well, that was uh, so. I have to. I have to say. Uh, I guess three things to make it simple. Uh, one is I also just realized last year I was asked to speak on Ashes of Time, mm -hmm. and I finally figured out what it was about, mm -hmm. which was nostalgia. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd been teaching mm -hmm. it for years, and I could never figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing by way of uh, coming out, if that you can call, I mean, I don't know, cultural studies people, can you come? I actually uh, inhabit the separ separate world of film studies in which I actually published an article mm -hmm. or so, and I've been in Hong Kong doing that. But I very much, because I am of my lineage, uh, separate in my mm. mind between doing history and film studies. And when I do mm. film studies, I'm not doing history. And when I do, but I agree with you that it is something. Uh, but the other thing that I found was really interesting is almost everything you said was something I have been involved in dealing with in the last few years. Because I don't know, most people here only saw the martial arts stuff I do, but I write on, I wrote a book on the history of guns and gunpowder in China. Yeah, no, I know that. And yeah. while I'm doing mm. all this Chinese mm. martial arts stuff, I'm actually, I recently, three weeks ago, gave a paper on why guns stopped advancing in China. And it's a new theory mm. about which we'll see whether mm. it's proved mm. true. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, I guess uh, to be really lame about this, I'd agree with everything mm. you said, mm. ultimately, uh, in, in the sense that the, the films are real. And I see the reality of them in people's practice. Because uh, something my mother said to me a long time ago is, gangsters in America didn't know how to act until they saw James Cagney. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there are martial artists, I've been mentioning to a bunch of people, Ralph Thaxton's work. There are martial artists in China now who've been looking back to Shui Hu Juan mm. and following those practices in their brotherhoods. And, um, but they haven't read the text. They've seen mm. the television Maybe show. Television. And mm. so the, this translation of the past, which because I'm a pre-modernist, I, I mean, I'm always, I'm always going to see it as a historian. Mm. Because, but the difference between, I hope, in a positive sense between me and a lot of other historians is that I am interested in that. Why do people use history the way they do? So whereas in the martial arts book I talked about, you know, or you know, the guns, why did they imagine mm. this is not mm. the case? Uh, in other contexts, I mean, so I, I'm that, mm. I, I don't play mm. that cultural studies games where I encompass everything with uh, the theories. I very much divide things up because I deal with different audiences. Mm -hmm. And that's probably my mental limitations. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but so I, I, I agree with mm. everything. And, mm. and I feel kind of like, particularly when you start out with Ashes of Time and I'm watching, and I, I actually mm. watch clips of the martial arts fights in every single one of those movies mm. that you showed mm. in the days leading up to this. Mm. So mm. I felt like, except the one difference is when I was in Hong Kong talking about movies, and uh, the head of the Hong Kong Film Archive, where they called him, his nickname is Brother Blade, uh, or something like that, weird. Every time a martial arts move, a fight scene would come on, we would all go, all the real film guys in the room would go, oh, and we'd all be watching that. And then the other people were like, what are you guys watching? And then when they'd shift to the cultural studies stuff, that's when the cultural studies people would key in. Mm -hmm. And you could almost separate the room by the people mm -hmm. who are obsessed with the fight mm -hmm. and that film, mm -hmm. that, that perspective, and the people who were sort of, you know, okay, we got all the theory and all that. So yeah. I, it was. Yeah, I mean, I, just one little thing. I mean, yeah. I don't think, I mean, to me, cultural theory yeah. and cultural studies are, are really different. I know, like, in the US in particular, that isn't necessarily the case. But I think theory-driven cultural studies is often not very good because it's not asking frictional questions. You know, you have to have an empirical field in which you actually don't know the answer. And if, if your work is too theory driven, then particularly when it's taught as a, as a simple exercise in political allegory, then people have already got their answer. So they don't do the research and don't find anything out. But yeah, oh. thank you. I'm glad we agree. No, I wanted to put it on the same plane. I just do not, you know, yeah. Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, I have a question about mm. uh, the Jianghu. I think mm. the, for the Jin Yong series the, about Jianghu, he said uh, um, um, th there is a human being, so there are human societies, so there is a Jianghu. Mm -hmm. and in Chinese, uh, 有人的地方就有江湖. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wondering, uh, in his theory about Jianghu, 
it came out from the Chinese history for 2,000 years and um, each dynasty or each regime for killing each other and uh, the Jin Yun gives some up the, the theory of Jiang Hu or they make by himself or inventing of the idea of Jiang Hu. You're asking me yeah, if yeah. I think that about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, look, I, as I said, because I'm illiterate, uh, but there is now, just for other people, before I come back to your question, there's a great website, if you're interested in this, now called wuxiasociety.com. And that has links to the official translations of Jin Yong novels, but above all, it has really caring and careful pirate translations of huge chunks of these uh, novels. And it also has fan translations. So essentially, in English, you can cover most of the literature now. I think it's, it's, um, it's not that Jin Yong has a theory of Jiang Hu. It is, as you uh, said, he's tremendously learned and literate in the fiction accumulated in different versions. Uh, I don't know if Peter would let us go as far as saying 2,000 years, but certainly, yeah, a few hundred. A uh, couple of hundred. One hundred? Uh, uh, so the, yeah, a um, couple of hundred, but uh, the Shrinkadron stories, mm. there's a very good article by Paul Smith in which he shows that the Shrinkadron stories actually originated in the 12th century. Okay, yeah. And so they are compiled later, but right. they are actually, actually. They, they are 12th century popular right. stories right. that later get elaborated on, which was just shocking to me. Yeah, um, no, I, I, I think. And whether you right. want to argue that the term, you know, I'm mm. a fundamentally a philologist and etymologist, so mm. you asked me that question, and I got to go to a computer and start doing some yeah. researches. No, no, let's stick with yeah. uh, Jin Yong and, and his, you know. Um, he's a novelist, but if you read this wonderful book, um, Paper Swordsman by John Christopher Hamm, he does it inside a moment of empire building in the development of modern media in Hong Kong at the time where it's a pretty small society and these stories are feeding into everybody's life on a daily basis because they're serialised in the newspaper. Um, but then Jing Yong builds from that and builds his reputation specifically so that heads of state uh, in Taiwan and then after that finally the recognition came from the mainland but he was part of the negotiation of the basic law in Hong Kong. He produced himself. You know, so I think that's why he's important, uh, not as a, a theorist, but Stephen's written a, a very good article about the shift in the meaning of Jiang Hu precisely in that 1984-1997 period. Uh, it's called Figures of Hope, um, Jiang Hu and something or other, but how did Jiang Hu turn around in that in that very recent period to become so important. Do you see what I mean? I mean, stories can be there indeed for centuries, but the conditions in which they matter to people keep changing, and that's what we're looking at. We think there's another big shift happening right now with these more recent Donnie Yen productions. Thank you very much. Thank you.